You are listening to the Famous at Home podcast with Dr. Josh and Christy Straub. Because when it's all said and done, we all want to know that we were famous at home. Welcome back to the Famous at Home podcast. Today, I have my dear friend Jordan Rayner joining us. He has a new devotional out called The Word Before Work. He also has an incredible children's book uh, called The Creator in You. His heart has been all about finding the scriptural basis for work and the importance of that and how it applies to our everyday lives as we rethink the household and how the household builds for the kingdom of God. And so if you're a parent who's in the trenches, if you're someone who's going to work and you're just not even even sure if you're in the right job, this uh, interview is for you. I cannot wait for you to listen to our interview with Jordan Rayner. Before we jump in, here is a word from our sponsors. Welcome back to the Famous at Home podcast. I have a dear friend on today, Jordan Rayner, who is just, um, yeah, a delight. And I know you're going to love him. Uh, we've had him on in the past, uh, talking about the creator in you, his new children's book. And he has another book out called The Word Before Work, because his heart is helping people understand God's design for work. And I know many of you listening are some, many of you are, are you, you're dual income earners. Uh, you, you, both parents are working. Some of you have the privilege of being a stay at home parent and you enjoy it, but you also find like why am I in this? Uh, as Christy uh, talks about often, like what, where's the purpose in this? I feel lost. I feel overwhelmed. Jordan's going to come in today and talk about scripturally He's going to redeem, well, he doesn't redeem work. God redeems work, but Jordan's going to talk about how God redeems work for us. So Jordan, thank you for joining us today. Man, one of my favorite people in the world. I get to hang out with Josh Straub at the end of my day. This is amazing. Oh, are you kidding? <laughs> I feel I, that that's a, that is, that feeling goes both ways, my friend. So, hey, introduce yourself, Jordan. Introduce your family to us. Uh, tell us a little bit about you. Hey, guys. So Jordan Rayner based in Tampa, Florida where I live with my wife of 13 years, Kara. We got three little ones, Ellison, who's eight, Kate, who is six, and Emery, who is three. Yeah, so we're in the thick of it. Love it. Right? Uh, Love it. My wife, after a stellar career in financial services, um, has been working full-time within our house as a stay-at-home parent for the last six-ish years, and vocationally, I made the leap from tech entrepreneur. I spent about 10 years as a tech entrepreneur. And today, create content full-time that helps Christians connect the gospel of Jesus Christ to the work that they do in the world, inside and outside the home, to be crystal clear. Yeah, and I, I just... I we did an episode uh, a couple months back. We did a, a series through the fall on words that matter for our family. And one of those words, uh, right before we did that, we talked about rethinking the household and what does the household look like in redeeming the kingdom of God. And you and I think a lot alike. Uh, a lot of my thoughts, in fact, I, I referenced you numerous times throughout the, the last number of, of months on our own podcast. And we think a lot of like as it relates to the gospel. We think a lot of like as it relates to how all this comes into play. I would love for you to just describe a little bit, just give a little bit of an overview uh, about your philosophy. How did you come upon this stuff? I, especially, you yeah. just released a book, uh, a devotional called The Word Before Work. It's, a, it's an everyday devotional, uh, fantastic read, gives the foundation for all this stuff. But even before you started all this journey, what got you on this journey to begin with? Yeah. So about five years into my career as a tech entrepreneur, I was in the process of exiting my second company and I was trying to figure out what I was going to do next professionally. And when you sell two companies, the natural thing to do is you go, you go start a third, right? So that was kind of the plan. <laughs> um, but for a hot minute there, my wife and I, um, we're thinking really seriously about planning a church because mm. I was feeling uh, a tremendous amount of guilt that I think a lot of your listeners have felt that how dare I uh, want to live in suburban America? How dare I want to go start a business when people need to move to mud huts 5,000 miles away from home to quote unquote, make disciples of all nations. Mm. And I remember, so I was, we were praying about these two paths, start another business or start a church. And after church on Sunday, a mentor of mine 
approached me, godly guy, uh, one of the godliest people I've ever known. And he's like, hey, I hear you're thinking about planning a church. And I'm thinking that this guy's like going to pat me on the back, maybe write me my first check. <laughs> and he just looked me like dead in the eye. And he's like, yeah, I got to be honest. Like, that sounds really dumb for you, like personally. And I was like, what are you talking wow. about? He's like, Jordan, you're a gifted entrepreneur. You, I've seen you serve your customers and your team and your investors through the ministry of excellence, essentially was, he, was what he was saying. He's like, why do you think you have to go plant a church in order to do ministry? Like, don't you get that your work as an entrepreneur is ministry? And I looked at this guy like he had three heads because I'd heard that before, but it just sounded like nonsense. And I was just like, I, I, I have no idea what you're talking about. And he told me to do two things. He said, number one, I'm going to give you this great book by Tim Keller called Every Good Endeavor, mm. which forever changed my life. Great read. He said, I also want you to go read Genesis 1 and 2, which you've probably read 300 times, and read it in the context of this conversation, right? This idea that your work as an entrepreneur can be ministry. And so I did, and what I saw changed my life forever, right? I saw for the first time that before God tells us that he is holy or loving or omnipotent, he tells us that he is a God who works, a God who creates. Created is the first verb in the Bible. And then skip down a few verses to Genesis 1, 27 and 28. Work is the first gift mm. God gives to humankind, right? God could have finished creation all on his own, but instead he says, hey, let's make these kids in our image and give them the joy of participating in this project of filling and subduing and ruling the earth. And that, that changed my life. I saw for the first time that work was this gift, this good. Now, obviously Genesis three comes along and makes work difficult, but all throughout scripture, even past Genesis three, God is always reminding us of the goodness of work, of the God given dignity of the work of how our work has ripples into eternity. And so that, but that was the seed. That was the genesis of how I, I love got that. addicted. What a great mentor. Idea. What a fantastic mentor. I mean, geez, Louise, that guy's, <laughs> you talk about, you talk Legend. about butterfly effect in terms of now seeing all the work that you have done and the work that you are doing and how that is butterflying affected to ev all these other families listening to this podcast Great. right now, myself, like unbelievable how one life can have an impact on so many other as it relates to building the kingdom of God. Like one that, conversation that was just, <laughs> it's mind blowing to me that Crazy. that's, that, that's, it, it's just, but that's the kingdom of God. That's the kingdom of God. When we talk about rethinking the household and we talk about rethinking work in this context here and how work and the household go hand in hand. And for you, you know, I want to, I want to highlight something that you brought out there because I think it's important it is, is you talked about, uh, Pre work pre Genesis three and work post Genesis yeah. three, highlight yeah. that for me for a second. Yeah, sure. So let's begin. Right. So Genesis one twenty eight is the first commission to humankind. Way before the Great Commission comes onto the scene, the first thing God told us to do was fill, subdue, and rule the earth. Wayne Grudem, who some of you might have heard of, he's a really famous theologian. You probably known better as the editor of the ESV Bible. He says that what this passage means is simply for human beings to make the world more useful and enjoyable for other human beings benefit. That's it. That's what God mm. called us to do. At the beginning. <laughs> very, very simple to understand. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And this existed pre-fall. This is Genesis one and Genesis two. Sin doesn't come out of the scene in the Hebrew scriptures until Genesis three. And I grew up believing that work was the curse, right? Human sin and the punishment was you you're now, now going to work. work for a living, Yeah, right? That's a heretical, unbiblical lie that I was fed for a long time. And I think right? many of us were. Yeah, 100%. You will now toil and you will, yeah. You will now toil. Now this, this passage is there, right? This is Genesis 3. Work is cursed. After the fall, it is made more difficult right? We're going to have to work by the sweat of our brow, it says. We will we will produce fruit from the ground. Child labor is now difficult, but both of these things are not in and of themselves the cursed. They are 
cursed. They are cursed. And that makes good, all the difference in the world. It's good. Yeah. And I think the reason I asked that question is because I know there's many parents listening in today. A lot of moms who listen to this who are just there. They're in it. You know, you're in it eight, six, and three. We're in it 10, eight, and two. I, I have friends I, I know listen to this podcast who have four kids under the age of five. Like, I mean, with the Jeez. people who are just in a it. A blessing in it. on your I, house. A blessing. Like, but in it and, and just the sense of like, how do we redeem in the household? How do we redeem in the home what feels absolutely exhausting? How, how can, how can we like put a different lens on, if you will, for parents right now in terms of perspective in the yeah. trenches? This is good. So it's an interesting way to think about this through the five chapters, if you will, of God's word. So at like a high level, the biblical story follows this like five chapter arc, right? There's chapter one, which is creation. This is before the fall. Everything's good. Everything's perfect, right? And we could assume that if Adam and Eve had kids before the fall, that family unit would have been perfect. There would have been, I don't know, no kids <laughs> throwing up. Like we have to like clean up, <laughs> right? Amazing. Like, I don't know, it right? Like, like, like it's no one. temper tantrums. No temper tantrums. Chapter two is the fall. Sin messed everything up. Chapter three is redemption. So Christ has bought back by his precious blood everything that sin broke in Genesis 3, right? But right now you and I are living in chapter five, which is sorry, chapter four of this narrative, which is renewal, right? So mm. it's interesting to think about this, like, it was perfectly within God's power to fully reveal the kingdom of God as we will understand it when heaven comes to earth at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? Hmm. And that's exactly what yeah. the disciples were expecting. They were like, hey, Lord, are you at this time? This is Acts 1, 6. Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel to Israel? Right. And he said, no, 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 no. You will be my witnesses, i.e. you will be the ones to help restore and renew creation including the family unit, including industries and culture in partnership with me through the power of the Holy Spirit until chapter five consummation, God alone finishes the work and fully lifts the veil between heaven and earth, right? So thinking about the family unit within that five chapter construct, okay, we're living in chapter four. We're not called to just simply wait around for Jesus to drop heaven from the sky, Jesus told us that what waiting looks like is working, is busy yeah. in our hands to make our households and our neighborhoods and our communities and our world look a little bit more like what the whole earth is going to look like when Jesus fully lifts that veil between heaven and earth, right? And we can go in a million different directions of what that looks like, but you know, real practical within our household, that means in the fully consummated kingdom of God, there's perfect relationship between all human beings. Yeah. So in our household, we don't let things go unspoken. We don't let anger simmer beneath the surface. We fight for peace amongst all people, right? In the kingdom of God, there is no one who feels out of place, no one who feels like they don't belong. And so our households are hospitable to our neighbors, to the lost, to everybody who doesn't have a sense of belonging in their lives, right? The kingdom of God is free from anxiety, so yeah. we fight against anxiety in our household. Those are just a few examples. I love but it. that's what we're called to in the present. Oh, and, and it's such a perspective shift. Listen, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to get into some of the meat and practicalities of what this perspective shift means for us. Jordan, so I have a question for you. I was going to ask you this offline, but I figured well, let's do this while we're recording. Let's just have a conversation. Risky, have you, risky. Rec have you, have you recently, ha have you read the book, Imagine Heaven, or have you heard of it? I've heard of it. I haven't read it, John but I've Burke. read a ton okay. on heaven. Yeah. Okay. So I have read a ton on heaven, uh, since my dad died in 2016. And what yeah. you, when you were just talking there, when you talked about the five chapters, we're in chapter four, yeah. chapter five will be consummation. I'm going to just go ahead and say this to you. Um, uh, and again, I don't even know the guy who wrote the book. I just know it is in my mind, the best book on heaven I've ever read. Like it is wow. like, and Long I, words. and I've read Randy Alcorn, all amazing yeah. books, John Eldridge, you name it. This sure. book will, because what he does is he takes a, uh, this guy takes a, um, 
uh, near-death experiences, and he looks at research studies of near-death experiences across the world, not just Westerners, but also Middle Eastern, uh, every religion, you name it, and he takes the corroborating evidence and he filters it through scripture to look at what will heaven be like. Is it, it is, are these near-death experiences actually, and I'm telling you, J.P. Moreland, uh, yeah. it, he, he endorses the book, all these theologians do, and I'm telling you, what I left that book feeling was this same sense that you have, like my difficult days at work are, it, it just changed my perspective on what those, what that will look like, especially even with my kids in my home. So you're talking about, let's talk about anger. Let's not, let's not let things fester. One of the greatest takeaways for me in that book was that what's not, what matters the most at the end of life isn't what we accomplished it isn't uh, the trophies we got. It isn't the awards we won. It isn't, uh, you know, getting the pay raise and climbing the corporate ladder. What mattered were how the effect that we left on the people that we interacted with. Our motives, our feelings, our, 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 even our motives behind our actions and how, we, uh, how another person felt. Did we love well? I mean, it ultimately comes down to how well did we love in the moment. And I'm telling you, to me... It just simplified some of this, like, you know, as you and I know, we talk about the, the kingdom of God, partnering with God in the kingdom of God. So much of this is about love and what lives beyond us is how well are we loving those around us? And that includes our coworkers. It includes our employees. It includes our kids. It includes our spouses. How well are we doing that? And I would love for you to talk a little bit about, you know, in, in this light, what does it mean that we are between chapter four and chapter five. What does that look like from your perspective as it relates to work and the work that we're doing both in our homes and outside our homes? Yeah, it's a really good question. I, I think what it means, I think there's this like misguided sense in the church today that between chapter four and chapter five, we're just called to like keep watch for Christ's return. Like this is what's given rise to the burgeoning American end times industry that is firing on all cylinders, uh, getting us all hot and bothered about how it's going to happen, when it's going to happen, where it's going to happen. Anytime this topic came up, Jesus redirected people's attention away from the details of his second coming and towards the task of cultivating heaven on earth in the present, right? Mm -hmm. This is Acts 1-8. After the disciples said, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He says, hey, 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 you're going to be my witnesses. In other words, don't worry about the time. I'm reorienting you to a task. And the task is to scratch off the thin veil that currently separates heaven and earth. Right? Yeah. Do, do you guys, Josh, do your Ooh. kids, do God. your kids have these like black scratch offs around the house that leave black residue all over? Oh, yeah. I know. Yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yep. Yep. I actually think this is a really good picture yep. of the purpose of our work. So, if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's these like black little scratch. I'm not talking about gambling. Please don't send me your angry emails. <laughs> right? I'm not doing gambling. playing the lottery. That's right. That's right. No, but these like yeah. black scratch offs, you take a stylus, you rub it away, yeah. and there's something beautiful on the other side. Yeah. That'll preach. Yeah. That's a picture of the work we're called to. This world is still currently marred by sin. There are plenty of square miles of this world that don't look like. Jesus is king of that square mile of this world. Yeah. Our job is to implement Jesus's kingship in the present, to be the people who are scratching off that thin veil that gives other people a glimpse of what's on the other side of what will one day be all in all this kingdom of God. And that could sound amorphous. I understand that that could sound mysterious, but this is exactly what Jesus was doing during his time on earth. Right. Yeah. Yeah, he was yeah. turning water into wine and scratching off a glimpse of this never ending feast that we're going to experience on the new earth. Right. He was healing the sick and giving us a glimpse of a day where there will be no more death or crying or mourning or pain. He was loving people. Perfectly. Giving us a glimpse of the day when God's all encompassing love will be all in all. Right. So. How do we do that in the home? How do we do that in the work? That's the work we got to work out. How do we, where are we called to scratch off the kingdom in the oh, present? So good. What you're describing there, that mystery, that that unveiling, I feel like, 
and and this is big to say and it, it, reading that book actually helped me un scratch off a little bit more yeah. like it was like yeah, I, yeah. I could see the layers the cosmos and the and the differing layers of heaven and earth and it, you can see what's taking place in a way that's real uh i feel like anyway and it was it was i gotta check it out because it was it was worth it, it or, i mean it, it keeps coming up in in this conversation and the things that you're saying because that perspective shift because it is hard to, to do that perspective shift when you've been taught throughout your entire lives that it's like you have to go be a missionary you have to go be a pastor you have to just get people safe from their sins and that there's not really a uh a red and then we just have to wait for jesus is coming which is why that whole industry has taken off is because it's no it's not just waiting it's no what is happening in the present yeah, well, I think we we tend to think of there's a lot of half truths we've been sold about heaven, right? Mm. I, I think maybe the the number one half truth is like heaven is a place that we go to in the in the future, right? Right. And oh, this is interesting. Kind of true. Yeah. Right. Like when if if I died today before Jesus returned, it's true that my soul departs and goes to be with God and the temporary heaven, the present heaven, right. but heaven, the whole truth is that heaven is a place and a state of affairs that is visible in part now and in full in the future. Right? Yeah. yeah, And you and I get to be a conduit and a means through which we make heaven a little bit more visible, tangible, um, concrete to those around us today. Love it. Love it. And that, so I would love for you to talk. Uh, the word before work is a very practical devotional. A lot of the things yes. that you're hearing Jordan talk about come from this work because you have read the Bible front to back multiple times, but you talk about how you did it uh, because you wanted to just, you wanted to extract everything about work. What are some things that you, so, so you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you, the whole purpose was to extract everything that you read uh, about work that God mentions about work. Yeah. Tell me some of those narratives, some of those lessons that you learned going through that exercise. Amazing by yeah. the way, doing that. Yeah. Yeah. So number one, God defines work far more broadly than we do, right? Like we, we define work as the thing I get paid to do. Uh, God defines it so broadly that when he's handed down the 10 commandments in Exodus 20, he says that even animals work. It's in the context of the fourth commandment and the command to Sabbath. He says that your animals need to rest from your work. What, what's the point? The point is that you as a stay-at-home parent and you as a barista and an entrepreneur and a maker, all of that is work. The work of changing diapers, all of this is work to the God of the Bible. That's number one. We see that theme all throughout scripture. Number two this theme that kept coming up over and over again is that we worship a God who works, which is radical mm. and unique in the history of world religions, right? No other religion claims that God himself worked. Every other religion says that the gods created human beings to do the menial work of the world to serve the gods. And yet Christianity, the very first page, starts at the God who works to serve us. Mm. That's radical. And that gives untold dignity to the work we all do in the world. And then the last thing I would say, which we've already touched on, is that the purpose of our salvation isn't just to sit around and wait for eternity. The very purpose of mm. salvation from Genesis 9 all the way to the end is to do good works, right? Uh, Exodus A is a great example. In Egypt, the Lord said to Moses, go into Pharaoh and say to him, let my people go. Why? that they may serve me. Jeremiah 15, 19, God said, if you repent, I will restore you, that you may serve me. And the same is true in the New Testament. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 is this beautiful passage of scripture. In verses 8 through 9, Paul says, hey, you have been saved by faith through grace. This is not from yourself. It is a gift of God, gift from God. So he's saying, hey, you haven't been saved by your works. But then he goes on in verse 10, he says, hey, you have been saved for good works. Paul says we were created in Christ Jesus, i.e. redeemed, i.e. saved. Why? To do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And it's interesting, this, this Greek word that we translate to good works here, you see all throughout the New Testament. Paul used it all the time. Jesus used it all the time. It literally means, according to every biblical concordance I found, quote, work, task, and employment. 
So mm. part of the very purpose of your salvation isn't just to wait for your soul to return to God. It is to get back to doing good works, good changing of diapers, good making of widgets, good sweeping of the floors in ways that are in accordance with God's commands to God's greater glory. That's why you've been saved so that other people may see your good works and give glory to your father who is in heaven. Jesus says gives such a great meaning to Colossians where he says, do all as unto the Lord, everything that you do, do it as unto the Lord. You know, I've been thinking about that recently in my own life as I've been, uh, you know, uh, I read this great book, um, called the household and the war for the cosmos. And one of the things that he mentions is there, he talks about this, this whole idea of piety and how we've lost the word and how meanings of words have been watered down as we through the generations. And he talks about how piety uh, basically went to household piety, went down to um, devotions. And then we, we made it even into spiritual disciplines. And he said, you know, I might get some kickback here, but then we moved it down to quiet time and we called it QT for short. He's like, yeah. but, but piety is a way of life. QT, your quiet time is something mm -hmm. you add to your to-do list. And we are called to live this pious life. And, and it, it helped me train. It helped me think about the way that I lead my household. And so therefore, as I do all things unto the Lord, what I'm doing now is I'm even watching in what would have been in the past. I've worked really hard today. I just need to take a break. Yes. The floors need to be vacuumed, but Christy will get to that later. This is my brain playing <laughs> out, right? Like this is my brain. And I'm going, now, wait a minute. Christy has also homeschooled the kids today. Christy has also cleaned this, you know, she's done X, Y, and Z. She's helped me with the podcast. She's helped me do a number of different things. She's exhausted too. Why would I think that I would wait for her? So I just jump in and I do it as unto the Lord, knowing that it is a duty in my life and a God. And so therefore it changes how I vacuum the house because I'm not vacuuming the house anymore out of resentment towards Christy that it wasn't done. Or, and again, this is just an example, but how often do we do this in our lives yeah. where I'm not like privately in my mode of like, just going, ah, I just wish that she would have done it. Or I wish I wouldn't have to do this. It's like, no, as the father and husband of this house, I'm going to do this. So number one, she feels more peace in her home and she doesn't have to do it later. It, it's a completely different perspective when we yeah. look at life that way. And I yeah, think and what so, you're talking about it comes down to that granular level. hundred percent. So you're quoting from Colossians 3, 23, where Paul tells us to work heartily as unto the Lord in everything we do. And then he gives us a reason why beyond the fact that like God's word commands it right in verse 24, he says, because there's an eternal reward waiting for you. Right. Oh, that's. Then, oh. I, I want. I want to read another passage though that that may feel a little bit more tangible, a little bit more now, because eternal rewards can feel um, very difficult to grasp. Yeah. Listen yeah. to Psalm thirty-seven twenty-three. The Lord directs the steps of the godly, and He delights in every detail of their lives. Mm. Not just when you're sharing the gospel or doing your QT. As Josh says, not just when you're worshiping Jesus at church, anytime you sacrifice for the good of your spouse, like Josh just described, God sees it and delights in that detail. Every time you change a diaper in accordance with God's commands, i.e. not grumbling and complaining like I do 50% of the time, right? <laughs> God delights in that detail of your life. And it, I think if we could just keep that idea at the forefront That'll change the way we do our work inside and outside of the home in some pretty dramatic ways. Dude, that is that right there. The rewarding of heaven it, is it, it, it's just it's highlighted in that Imagine Heaven book. I'm telling you, everything we're talking about, that practically put it in a way for me in so many different ways of what we talk about that just was awesome for me. So anyway, I, I don't want to overhype it. It just was helpful for me. So, um, not just affiliate link for yeah, the Yeah, exactly. And I have zero affiliate link. I don't even know the guy. <laughs> I just, I just know that it was absolutely unbelievably helpful. It. Hey, in the book, you argue that Mary's vocation as a wife and a mother tell us at least two things about our vocations today. What are they? In the word at work. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Number one, I think it shows us that God sees us in our work, even when the world doesn't. Right. You know, Mary oh. was this 
peasant teenage girl living in this backwater town. And we don't know what work she was doing before the angel showed up, but we can be certain that it was obscure, right? Mary is the ultimate anti-influencer. Nobody knew her name. Yeah. Nobody, of course, except God. And it just reminds us that when we work in obscurity as parents or middle managers or struggling artists, the God of the universe, Hebrews 6.10 tells us, will not forget your work. He sees it. It brings him delights on 37 to 23. And one day he will quote, reward each person according to what they have done. See Matthew 16, right? So that's number one. God sees your work even when nobody else does. Number two, Mary shows us that parenting is one of our most unique callings, right? Now, uh, apologies, Josh, if you've said this on the podcast, but I hate it when I hear people say, um, you know, God first, family second, work third, right? Like, because it just for a lot of reasons but like scripture never ranks callings in order of importance oh, so good yeah it's Preach. god first and everything else second yeah that's said right for those of us who have children parenting is one of our most unique callings mary, I, mary was the only person god called the mother of jesus on earth and similarly, God has chosen me alone to father my kids, but he can choose anybody to do the work I do on my laptop, right? So scripture never says that our work inside the home is more important than the work we do outside of it, but it is more unique. And thus, we should be so much more intentional oh, about man. the work we do at home than the work we do in our offices. If you're uh, a stay-at-home parent or you're a parent who just feels lost right now and you just heard that, I just want you to take a deep breath and just think about Mary and just think about the obscurity. If you're feeling alone, you're feeling unseen, the, God sees you and it is real. And I know it doesn't often feel real, but go back to that, to that scripture that Jordan just talked about in Psalm 27. He delights in you. He delights in what you are doing and the changing of the diapers and, and, and I tell you, you know, it, what, I, there's a great devotion, a great liturgical prayer book called Every Moment Holy. And I would, I would also encourage you to book. get that book, man, because in there, I mean, there's, there's, there's liturgical prayers for everything, even the changing of diapers. I mean, and, and if you can pray uh, as you're changing diapers uh, before, or after, like in those, this is what is, is it's all about. It's putting God first. It's having God at the forefront of your mind and everything that we're doing. Will we always do that? Will we always get it right? Absolutely not. But that's why Jesus came to to redeem us. So that and repentance yeah. leads us right back to it. So repentance is leading us right back to keeping God at the forefront of our minds. And and I love it. So Jordan, I would I just want to ask you this question because I think it's it's important as we as we, as we're wrapping up today. We're here in the new year. We are. I mean, I just think this is such a great interview to think about in the new year because it just gives us encouragement leaving. Uh, everything, that, all of that that packages into the second, God first, everything second. Uh, to the people who are really struggling in their jobs, they are working outside the home. They are yep. maybe in a factory position that they just don't want to be in. Uh, right now, I mean, people are working just, you know, maybe even multiple jobs because they've got to make ends meet with inflation and everything happening in our culture. Speak to the person who's really struggling in their work right now. Yeah, man, this is so many of us. Here's what I would say to you. One day you're going to experience perfect work if you are in Christ Jesus, right? Let's go back to heaven. We got to get this foundation of the way real quick. We got to understand that ultimately heaven isn't in the clouds way up there. Scripture makes it abundantly clear that ultimately heaven is on a new physical material earth. And both Isaiah and Revelation make it crystal clear that there's going to be perfect work for us to do for all of eternity, which makes perfect sense given the biblical narrative that we just talked about a few minutes ago. The paradise of the Garden of Eden that we see in Genesis 1 and 2 was not an endless vacation, but a life-giving vocation, right? Oh, it's good. Work is cursed, not the cursed, but one day, if Jesus really came to make all things new and work was perfect prior to the fall, one day, Work will be perfect worship once again. And Isaiah 65 says this explicitly. Here's Isaiah 65, verse 22. As the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. 
My chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain. God's saying, we're not going to sing, Lord, I lift your name on high forever and ever, or recline in a hammock forever and ever. We will long enjoy the work of our hands forever and ever. So if you hate your job today, do three things. Number one, mourn over it. Like, call out yeah, to God that you hate good. your job. This good. is the impetus for the Exodus. Yeah, Go read Go read the first couple of chapters of Exodus. God heard the cries of his people because they were in slavery and were working under brutal conditions. Hate your job? Mourn over it. Jesus understands. He worked Love a hard it. job. Love it. Number two, look forward to Isaiah 65 and the day when you will long enjoy the work of your hands. And number three, we've already touched on in the present, even in the job that you hate, work heartily as unto the Lord, knowing yeah. that there is a there's an eternal reward in store for you. See Colossians 3. Yeah. That's so good. Yeah. Past, future, present. You're just, yes, you're there you go. Yeah. I love it. And, and, in the, the grand scheme of things, I mean, it's all, it's all one anyway, right? It's, it, That's we're exactly so right. limited to time and space. Hey, as we close, I would love for you, uh, and by the way, I want you to take a look at the book. Uh, it'll be in the show notes, the, the word before work. It's a incredible devotional every single day. Uh, I have been absolutely enjoying it. It just, it's just the nuggets that you need to really keep you focused with God at the forefront of your mind, even as you enter your work and consecrate your work to God every single day as you get to partner with him in making all things new. Uh, you've already kind of touched on this a little bit, Jordan, but I'd love for you to just talk about the ways that we get, because heaven is here, uh, shape. The, yeah. What are the ways that we get to shape heaven? And you put this in the oh, book. Man. I'd love for you to just so good. talk about how we get to do that. Yeah, you know, we've talked about a lot of them. Um, I'll just point to one that's, I don't think very obvious because we don't preach on it that much. Um, so if we understand that heaven is ultimately on earth, I think Josh is right with what he said before. I think what's most important is in shaping heaven is shaping who's there, shaping the relationships that are there, right? Mm -hmm. The people who are there. But it's not just redeemed people that we see in the ultimate eternal heaven on earth. We also see some of the work of our hands. There's this remarkable vision that Isaiah 60 paints where you see Jesus accepting the works, some of the works of human culture into the new Jerusalem. The nation of Tarshish brings their ships. The nations of Midian and Ephah bring their livestock. There's another nation that brings this refined gold and frankincense. What's the point? Yes, we shape what, who is in heaven as we share the gospel through our work. But God, through his miraculous power, will redeem some of the literal work of our hands and carry it into eternity. Now, it doesn't tell us exactly what that work is, yeah. but I think we can assume it's going to be work that's done with excellence and love and in accordance with God's commands. And so if you make things with your hands, if you write books, if you make art, if you make even things around your house, decorations that you're really proud of, I don't know of many more things more motivating than seeing those things adorning the new Jerusalem, seeing Jesus hang your painting on the walls of the 7 million foot tall city called the new Jerusalem and have it hang there for eternity. You know, I got that gets me. Oh my gosh. And you know, I got to be honest with you for so long. I really put God into a box. Like I, until I had this understanding of who God was, my God was so much smaller than I ever gave him credit for. And I have had to repent of that over and over and over and over again. Ditto. He is like, Ditto. God is just amazing. He is so big. He is so big. Jordan, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it is always a delight to have you. Uh, we we just uh, we have this kindred spirit as it relates to what it looks like uh, to to live for eternity, to partner with Jesus and making all things new, and uh, we're trying to live that out in our generation. So I just want to make sure uh, if you have not followed Jordan, if you have not followed his podcast, if you're not you don't have the word at work, we're going to put everything in the show notes so that you can go follow all of his work. Join his email list. He has an incredible uh, email list. Uh, emails that he sends out. And so we want to make sure that you get plugged in to what everything that Jordan is doing. Jordan, thank you again for joining us. Uh, it's an honor to have you and happy new year to you. Happy new year to you, brother. Thanks for having me. Hey, keep in mind until next week that the greatest red carpet you will walk is through your front door. 